my name is Rain Gagan, and um, I'm I'm a writer, and I've I've actually grown up listening to tales about hot picking. So, for example, my um, mum's side of the family, um, well, yes, my mum's side of the family, my granny and grandfather, all came to Bishop's Froom to hot pick. My granny was hot picking here since the 1920s. I believe they first started off in Bromstree. Um, then they came to Bishop's Froom and then they ended up at Five Bridges. But it was Bishop's Froom that I heard over and over again. And my mum would often tell me tales about the hot picking, how it was the best time of her life. Um, my granny would, would talk about farmer John Pudge and how good he was to, to all the, the Romany travellers. Um, and so when, um, when I started sort of looking at my next project to write about, my mentor said to me, why don't you write about your Romany family, Rain? And, and I, I've, done, I've been doing that for the last year. And it's amazing because the more I, I look into it, the more information that comes up. So I've got sort of stories about, um, you know, a mum's family, aunts have told me things. I've even put something on Facebook and I've had response from the Romany heritage sites. And I've, you know, I've come along today with um, not only their stories and their oral testimonies, but also um, a, a, cl a small collection of my own work. So I've written poems, monologues, short prose. And what I've tried to do is capture that sort of timeless feeling about what it was like in the hot fields. You know, what sort of things did they cook? What, what did they get up to? Um, and what's also rather special for me is the fact that my mum met my dad in the hot fields. My dad came from the Welsh Valleys. His name was Jim James Hill. My mum was called Phyllis Lane. And they met, fell in love. He was a pole puller. She was picking the hops. They fell in love. And um, in 1954 that was. And then that was the last year they did the hop picking. And then my mum married. I was born in 56. Sadly, my dad died in 1957 of a kidney disease. But I, I find it interesting that when I come back here, I have a real emotional connection with this place. So not only am I, um, I get excited about, you know, what all the travellers were doing, and they used to go and drink at the... Um, the Green Dragon and the fun they had and the singing and dancing and playing musical instruments. But I also feel that, that somehow I feel I belong here, I'm connected here. And so much so that, you know, my husband and I are thinking of coming back to live near Morven. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's my sort of connection with it. I've never hot-picked. I'm not really that sort of person. I'm not really a gardener or anything like that. But um, I, I have been able to listen and, um, and, and just get this feeling of what a lovely place Bishop's Room is, um, a, a special place. So that's why I was so eager to share what I've been doing. Yeah, yes, yes. Okay, so my family um, were, were traditional Romany travellers. My granny um, was born in Hanworth, um, in, in a place called Fells Yard. Her father, my great-grandfather, had a, had a small plot of land there, and they had quite a few wagons and also a railway sleeper that one that her sort of um, brother had for his family. And my mum was born in the wagon, um, and my auntie Mary as well, the two of them born in the wagon. And this was in Hanworth in Middlesex, so there, at that time there were quite a few Romney travellers that settled there, and it was a time when it was quite rural, unlike how it is today. And then um, my, my granny and grandfather were offered a new, brand new council house and I've actually got a poem about that because it was quite a big thing to move from a wagon, a vada, um, into, into a house. But my mum was 14 when they moved into that house. And going back, my great-grandfather 
um, John Ripley was born in Kent under a gooseberry bush. This is true. <laughs> and I've written about that as well. So what I've, I try and do is, is write about things that I've, I feel are quite interesting. So my grandfather, his side, were horse dealers in London. And his dad, Curly Lane, um, was a barrow boy. Um, and I only found out recently that for some reason they moved from London up to Birmingham in a place called Corley or near, near Corley and spent quite a bit of time there. But the Lanes and the Ripleys were very close. So, for example, my granny Amy and grandfather Alfie, they sort of married brother and sister. So, <laughs> it's a bit confusing. Grandfather's sister, Raya, married granny's brother, Sammy. So, where we lived, because I lived with my granny and grandfather for about five years after my dad died, with my mum and my sister, in a place called Winslow Way in Hamworth. And so, one family was down one end of the road, our family was up the other end of the road and we were all very very close and even now you've got second cousins and third cousins, distant cousins and we all share that same sort of enthusiasm for you know our, our ancestry our upbringing and of course you know Romani language was spoken and it's something I've been trying to you know re relearn and and look at the origins of that language um, so some of my work that I've written I've brought in some of the Romani language as well, and um, yeah, that, that's 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 my back. You know, that's my background. My other side, obviously, is from South Wales, and I've got the Irish ancestry as well. So, yeah. So you've asked me about this thing about marriage. Um, yes, going back to when my auntie Mary married my uncle Jimmy. Um, this was before my mum. I think it was just before my mum met my dad, or it was about the same time. But they wanted to get married. He was what's called a gorger, which is a non-Romany. My grandfather didn't like that one bit. Plus, Auntie Mary was quite young. And for some reason, they used to call Uncle Jimmy Spirit Boy. I still don't know exactly why they called him that. But maybe it was, maybe it was some sort of like, you know, they didn't want a non-Romany in the family. But anyway, my grandfather eventually gave up and they married because, because Uncle Jimmy was Irish and my granny loved the Irish. So, so that, that was done. Now, when my mum met my dad here, my dad was, a, he came up from the valleys um, near Tredega, where I was actually born in 1956. He came up with his mates because there was no work in the valleys. He, he did actually train as a pastry chef, um, but he didn't have work, so they came up to do a hot picking, one hot picking season. And he met my mum, my dad was called James, but Jim for short, James Hill. My mum, Phyllis, and he met my mum in the hot fields. My dad was a pole puller, my mum was a hot picker. And they fell in love straight away. And it's not surprising because my mum was really beautiful, my dad was very handsome, um, film starish, very tall, with dark brown eyes and a lovely smile, and my mum said she loved the way he spoke, with a Welsh lilting accent. They fell in love, and there wasn't any sort of real um, antagonism towards them, because, again, my granny and grandfather seemed to like the Welsh as well, so... And they loved Jimmy, you know, they thought he was such a lovely young man, and so they welcomed him, really. But they could only... My grandfather's quite strict, so it was only Friday night that they could go out courting. And my mum's cousin Becky used to go out with another Welsh man. And so they would, you know, get all dressed up. And my grandfather would say, will you be back at this time? And they would just walk around the village or, you know, go and have a drink outside the pub, that sort of thing. Um, anyway, they fell in love um, here in the hot fields. Um, and then they got married. Uh, that was in 1954. And then I was born in 1956. So, and then sadly my dad died in 1957 and we came back from Wales and we went to live with my granny grandfather in the house in Hanworth. Uh, my sister was born because when my dad died my mum was expecting my sister. Um, and she didn't know she was expecting it, not until she went to the doctors because she wasn't well. So Bev was born in the house in Hanworth and again we grew up, you know, we had dogs and pheasants and chickens and a tortoise and a rabbit and we grew up with that family until my mum remarried when I was seven 
Um, so, you know, I was part of that, that, that family. Um, and sadly, it affected my mum quite deeply because she never, ever got over losing my dad. And, um, you know, I, I, I can see that. She, she died some years ago, but I can, I can understand why. Um, so, yeah, so it's a special place. You know, it's like, it's a love story, isn't it, really? Um, yeah. Great granny. Great granny. She was such an amazing character. Yes. Truth, really. Yes, she Can was. Just, just tell us about her. Yes. Well, well, both my great grannies were, were... I haven't got a picture of my grandfather's mum, but um, her name was Phyllis. My mum was named after her. Um, but my mum's friend, Mavis, tells me... I'm, I'm just digressing, but I'll come on to my other granny. Um, so... Phyllis Lane. She used to wear little boots, and she used to wear like a bit like a bowler hat, um, and very long skirts and petticoats, and and she just walked everywhere. She would never get on a bus, and um, but again, a, a real character walking around the streets. Everyone sort of knew who she was. And the same with my great granny. She was a very strong woman. You can see in her, you know, her cheekbones, and and. Um, yeah, my, my granny sort of thought the world of her, often, often talked about her. And my mum, my, gran, my great granny, used to call my mum the plum pudding girl because I don't know if you know about the Romanys, they used to make puddings. Um, they called them plum pudding, bacon pudding, and it would be all suet wrapped in a cloth and popped in a boiling pot of water. And people could call it gypsy grub. It's called Gypsy Grub. And so they, my mum would go over to their, their place um, and they ended up buying, when they moved out of the wagon, they bought a little bungalow. My mum would come up, go over on a Friday night and they would, she, they would make, my gra great granny would make a plum pudding for my mum and give her sixpence. And so they were very, very close. But yeah, very, had very hard, hard life, you know, travelling around in, in the wagons. And... You know, as I said, my grand's dad was born in Kent, actually under Gooseberry Bush, on the way to Strawberry Pick, in the middle of nowhere. And I and I wrote a piece about this because I just I just thought this that was pretty amazing. Um, so yes, qu quite sort of interesting characters, and spoke a lot of Romany and had very very strict rules about how to bring up the children. They're very very strict families both my granny and grandfather, um, you know, and what to wear and what not to wear. And my granny, my great-grandfather, John Ripley, was, was quite a hard man and used to literally beat my granny if, for example, he told her to go out and sell the flowers. And if she spent any of the money, they called money poshes then, if you spend any poshes, Amy, I'll, you know, I'll beat you. And she used to go out, and of course she'd get carried away. She, my granny, Amy, always loved bright colours and clothes and shoes, and she'd end up buying things out of the money, <coughs> out of the profits. And so she'd get that, and she'd have to hide from her dad. So, yeah, so it's just a little indication of what it was like. <laughs> yeah, so this one I know is in Bishop's Room in the Hopfields. Um, that's my great granny, great granny Amy, and my great aunt Vera, and they're, you know, standing either side of the crib with the hops, pulling the hops, and you can see they're sort of focusing on that. It's a lovely photo. The the, the vines are sort of more or less bare now. It looks like it's the end of the season. So that's that one, and this one they're sitting all sitting outside. The, the, the front of their tent. This time they are posing, that one before they weren't, but this one they're all smiling. My great uncle Tommy's got his arms crossed and he was quite an amazing character. He liked betting on the horses and he and Vera sold flowers outside Windsor Castle and met some very interesting people. And then my great granny again, and this time she's smiling and she looks so much softer here and a distant cousin, Linda. So that's that one. This one is just one I, I love because obviously my mum was born in a proper gypsy vada. Um, Uncle Alfie, he's, he's her baby brother. And that's my granny, Amy, 
sitting in, in, just inside the Varda there. I think they'd been out for the day and, and come across this Varda that was exactly like their one. So they, they had some, a photograph taken. This one I think is in Kent actually, and it's a group of hop pickers and fruit pickers. And my mum and my mum's cousin Raya are at the back there. And you can see they're all, you know, there's a lovely camaraderie there. They're all happy and smiling which I think, you know, that was the, the whole thing about the hop, hop picking. They were all happy to, to do it. And believe me, I know that the Romanis did work very hard and they were the best pickers. I was told that. <laughs> and that's my granny. It's a very old magazine. We didn't know, we don't know which magazine this came from, but she's photographed here with her bar of flowers, about to get on the train up to Waterloo to Nine Elms Market, where she would, sorry, she probably just got off because all her flowers are there, um, where she would buy all her flowers, come back, and then she would sell them for the following two days. She would wear a blue money belt round her waist, and she always sold out. And that's Granny in her front garden, where she used to live. That was the house she moved into when my mum was 14, and she lived there for the rest of her life. And that's... Um, yeah, that's another one in the hop fields in Bishop's Froome, I believe, with my granny, that's distant cousins, Owen, Linda, and Aunt Vera. And again, you can see that's very strong um, facial features and the way she's holding the hops there and the way they're, they're posing for the camera. So that's, that's the selection of photos I brought. Yeah, so after a long day of hop picking, um, what they would do, they would, um, some of them would, some of the men would jump on the back of a cart and literally just come straight down to the Green Dragon. Some of them did go to the chase, but the Green Dragon was their favourite pub, and that's where they congregated. Now, I've heard many things about the pub. Um, one from the, 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 the landlord that was there about five years ago when I came up with my husband, and he reminded me that what they used, because the old landlord told him about it, and he said that in the olden days when all the Romany travellers used to, to go up to drink, they would fill a bath outside the pub of beer, and the men would go and get their tankards or, or glasses or whatever, and they would go out and they would fill their glasses with the beer. It would be running down their, their, their fronts, you know, their, their, their sort of clothing and dribbling and they would just be drinking it because they were so thirsty and the other thing that they used to have to do sometimes would be to call in the local constabulary because not all the Romany families and not all the other non-Romany travellers would would um, you know would would become unruly but there were a couple of families that were notorious and when they were coming up here and if word got out the local constabulary were called in to just come and keep the peace, to, to keep an eye on things. Um, and I, I, I thought, yeah, I can understand that. Now, my family, um, after, after a long night, particularly like Friday, Saturday night, what they would do is all the whole family would come up, not just the men, but the women as well, and the young children would stay outside. And very often, like my mum had a lovely voice, so she would often, my grandfather would say, go on my filly, jump up on the table, give us a song. And so she would, a, a song is called Gilly. I, I think it may be the same as in Scotland, I don't know, but in Rome it was called Gilly, give us a Gilly. And so she would jump up on the table and she would sing a song and then everyone would join in. Somebody would be playing the fiddle. My grandfather would play the harmonica. Somebody else would be playing the accordion and it would be a big party. And as I grew up with Romany people, I know that there's one thing they know how to do and that's enjoy themselves. So they like storytelling, they like song, they like music, they like dancing. And I think that's one of the reasons my mum often said that, and because she met my dad there and fell in love, but that that was the best time of her life. That you would work hard, really hard, but you would also enjoy yourself. No, but I tell you one song they did used to sing. Let me just think of the, 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 the words and the tune. Um, if I had my life to live over, I would still fall in love with you. We would walk down the lane with a happy refrain. 
da 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 I'll meet you when school days are over and we'll walk down the lane once again If I had my life to live over I would still fall in love with you That was my granny's favourite song. I did, couldn't remember all the words. Right, okay. I'm a true Didikai. Oh, hang on, I've forgotten it now. Um, I'm a true Didikai. Oh, sorry, I'll start again. I'm a Romany rye, a true Didikai. I live all my has been I l something something oh hang on I start again. I do know it. It's just a, one chorus. Yeah. I haven't got the book here because I did have it in my book. I'm a Romany rye, a true Didikai. I leave all my houses. Beneath the blue sky, I live in a tent, I don't pay no rent, and that's why they call me a Romany Rye. And I'm sorry, I've got, I forgot the second line, but that's a song they all sang, and then there was a chorus, a Romany Rye did a kite, and it sort of went on and on, and, and I don't know the chorus, but that is a song that they used to sing, and I love that song. A Didikai is somebody that's half Romany and half Gorgia, and Gorgia is non-Romany, so I am a Didikai. Um, it, it's a lovely word, and I don't know if you know much about the Romany language, but because I've been doing a lot of research, um, it actually comes from the ancient Indian language of Sanskrit and, and Hindi as well as Hindi Punjabi, but um, some of the words are just, just beautiful, um, and I... I would like to read a couple of my, my pieces, and I've got a few Romany words in there, so. So I've got a few of my poems here which have been inspired by the hot picking, um, particularly here at Bishop's Froome, and you'll notice that I've actually mentioned Bishop's Froome in a couple of poems. First one is The Way of the Gypsy, Amy Lane. Amy took off her coat, untied her money belt, looked at her daughter, who had a hula hoop at her feet. Make me some mesky, child, and a sandwich. I'm famished and full of dust. Gel on. She'd had a good day, had sold all the flowers, even the dahlias that were past their best. Her back ached, her pyros were sore, but she was smiling. She was slowly growing accustomed to the house, the big rooms, windows that needed cleaning every day. She wasn't sure about the neighbours, especially the one with all the cats. She seemed to look down her nose at Amy. She missed the Varda, cooking on the fire in the open toba. Thank the blessed Lord we're going up picking, she said under her breath. Two more weeks and they'd be off to Bishop's Froom in beautiful Herefordshire. The table in the hop fields in Bishop's Froom. We got to the hop fields just as the sun was coming up. We walked across the pooh and there was our Aunt Amy pouring panny from the kettle into the big brown teapot. She'd covered the table with a white lace cloth and had laid out her best china crockery. Here you are, my girls. Come and have a bit of breakfast and a nice cup of mesky. My sister and I couldn't help but laugh. The table looked so funny in the middle of nowhere. Now listen here. We've got to pick a lot of ops today. Yearn ourselves some poshies. We sat on the red check blanket, the grass still wet from the morning dew. She gave us bread, cheese, and a cup of sweet mesky. She put her hands on her hips and looked around as if she was waiting for someone. Here he is, about time too. It was our Uncle Tommy come all the way from Annath. I knew with him helping we'd pick a load of ops. He comes striding across the poove, a big smile on his face, his trilby on, and his waistcoat all buttoned up. He always did look smart. Well, well, ain't this cushy, Amy? You made yourself at home, I see. What a lovely spread. Don't seem that long ago that we were on rations, Tom. And you know me, I do like a nice bit of grub. 
So this is a poem um, really based on my granny. She often used to go into the front garden and pick bluebells. And um, yes, it's called A Memory of the Hop Fields. She is in the front garden, bending low, picking bluebells, wearing her old red apron with a Spanish dancer on the front. She stands up, rubbing her lower back, her mind shaping a memory. The hop fields, her mother lean, strong, picking the hops as quick as a squirrel, her bowl in plaits tied on top of her head, her gold hoops pulling her ears down, ruddy cheeks, dry cracked lips, her father pulling poles, sweating, smiling, his gold tooth for all to see. At the end of a long day, she would stand on top of an apple crate, comb his hair, kiss his neck, tasting of salt. He would pick her up, swing her high, then low, and say, you're the prettiest little chai there ever was. Okay. Absolutely perfect. Audio conditions then, and motorbikes. <laughs> that was lovely. And the next one, the last one, is the table in the hop fields in Bishop's Froom. And this was just recently told to me by my mum's cousin, Shirley, um, about the time when she was about 14 and she'd come down to Bishop's Froom. She saw my granny in the field. My granny had put a lace tablecloth over the table. And this is her story. We got to the hop fields just as the sun was coming up. We walked across the pooh, and there was our Aunt Amy pouring panny from the kettle into the big brown teapot. She'd covered the table with a wet white lace cloth and had laid out her best china crockery. Here you are, my girls. Come and have a bit of breakfast and a nice cup of mesky. Me sister and I couldn't help but laugh. The table looked so funny in the middle of nowhere. Now listen here. We got to pick a lot of ops today, yearn ourselves some poshes. We sat on the red check blanket, the grass still wet from the morning dew. She gave us bread, cheese and a cup of sweet mesky. She put her hands on her hips and looked around as if she was waiting for someone. Here he is, about time too. It was our Uncle Tommy come all the way from Annus. I knew with him helping us we'd pick loads of ops. He comes striding across the poof, a big smile on his face, his trilby hat on, and his waistcoat all buttoned up. He always did look smart. Well, well, ain't this cushy, Amy? You made yourself at home, I see. What a lovely spread. It don't seem that long ago that we were on rations, Tom. And you know me, I do like a nice bit of grub. He kissed her cheek, bent down, tickled us girls and made us giggle. One by one, the rest of our people joined us, more out of curiosity than anything else. They were just as amused as me sister and me. We all knew that Aunt Amy liked to do her own thing. We never knew what the, ne the next thing might be. Hungry finches waiting for crumbs as we ate our grub. A bell rings. It's hopping time. Lovely, that's great. In some of these poems, I've used Romany words, and um, in this one, poof means field, pani is water, mesky is tea, poshes is money, and kushti, you all know that word, is very nice. In the other poem is bal, which means hair, and chai, which is daughter or child. Yes, okay, so um, step dancing is something that all the Romany travellers, well not all of them, but a lot of them used to do and still do now. Um, what, I actually got a memory about when I was in a, a pub in Walton um, with some of my mum's cousins. It was Mushy and Tommy and I'd taken my tap shoes over to give them a little bit of a tap dance because my granny said, put your tap shoes in, in the bag. Um, but when we got there, they had a board behind the bar and they brought the board out and one of my mum's cousins started doing step dancing. Now, step dancing is like, is like tap dancing and a lot of the men do it, actually. 
and and the, and it's you know it's it's using the ball and the toe of the foot, and it's it's doing this little rhythm rhythm rhythmical sort of um, thing, and the arms going like this. Um, and th they used to do it here in, in Bishop's Froom. They'd have a board in the wagon or, or the vans or something. They, they'd bring it out, and one by one, the members of the family would get on the board, and people would, would clap them along, um, and they used to take it up, up outside the pub, and after they'd had a bit of a sing-song, they'd say, come on, come on, my girl, come and give us a little dance, and they'd, they'd stand on the board, put their, sh their proper shoes on, and, and do a little step dance. Um, it's, so it's interesting because if you think about where Romanis come from, you know, India, and, and years, many years ago I used to do Indian classical dance, Kathak, which is you put the bells around your ankles, but it's, again, bare feet, but you're tapping your feet on the, on the floor. And then if you think about the flamenco, so you have the Indian gypsies, you've got the flamenco dancers, again, doing that. And then you've got the step dancing here. You know, I guess you've also got like sort of Morris dancing and all sorts of folk dancing. But it's something that, that, that the gypsies do. And I, I recently heard that one young guy is apparently the UK champion of step dancing. <laughs> that was quite interesting. But it's something they all love to do. And my granny used to sometimes pull her skirts up when she'd had a few too many whiskies. And she'd say, give order. That's what she'd give order. And she'd move into the floor and she'd do this little bit of a step dance. <laughs> and that was great fun. Accent. Okay, so. Yeah, sometimes. Mm. So sometimes people would have fiddles. That's obviously a, a big part of the, the Romani tradition. And the harmonica or the accordion. Uh -huh. um, but obviously accordions use more for sort of um, more ballads and things, you know, folky songs. But um, more nine out of ten times they just dance because it's, the, it's that sort of rhythm that they get and the sound of the, the shoe against the board you know, that's quite important. But they did also, I must say this, they, they liked a lot of Irish music and Irish songs, always very popular. With the um, playing musical instruments, um, I'm, I'm picturing this taking place in the pub, but did it also happen down in the hot fields as well? Where yeah, they yeah, where they camped, or if they had like a, a fire going, it would be round the, round the campfire. Um, and sometimes just outside the huts, they just... You know, part, part of the Romani culture is, is being spontaneous and if they're in a good mood and maybe they've, they've had a good week, you know, they, they would have a, have a song, have a sing song and the, and the instruments would come out and they would encourage each other to sing and they would have pleasure in, in, in that, you know, listening and there was, not, there was not much competitiveness in terms of their creativity. It would be a, a mutual sharing of things. Um, and as I said, that's what I gr grew up with, singing and dancing and, you know, talking about the old days. Um, I was going to ask you about some of the words that you sing, um, a bit talking about. Um, one of the words from the play that you were saying um, in the play part was the word for getting drunk. Yes, yeah, skimmished. Yeah, I love that word, don't you? Because it's just got, I know it's got something about it, skimmished. So um, my granny would often say, um, you know, oh, we went down to the, she used to call the pub the beer shop. We went down to the beer shop and we all stood outside and we all got skimmished, didn't we, Alf? Or, you know, or didn't we, didn't we, my filly, sort of thing. Um, yeah, there are, there are a lot of words that, that are, are quite interesting. And again, you know, they, that does have that sort of Indian influence. So, yeah. For the video, Rain needs to spell out the fact that skimish means getting drunk. Oh, really? Did you think that? All right. Yeah. <laughs> so, should I say that? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, skimish means getting drunk. So, you know, we were outside the beer shop and we all got skimished, didn't we, Alf? You know, all oh, what a lot of whiskey we had. We were all skimished. Yeah. Yes. 
Well, the, the general, yeah, the, the general word for food is obin. Um, it, it's spelled H O B B E N, but it's usually pronounced as obin. Um, and there are other words which, obviously, I have a limited vocabulary because I don't actually speak the language at the moment. But I'm relearning some of these these languages. So something like hedgehog that they would have had. The word for hedgehog is hotchy witchy, also called hotchy, and in, and some people used to call it jog jog as well. And then you'd have rabbits. They often have rabbit stew. They love their rabbit stew, and that was called sushi or shushu. So there's all these sort of different types of words for, for food and drinks and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And one last one then. Okay. Was about the old farm coach. Yes. Yes, the old farmer Pudge, whom I believe is also called John Pudge, um, because my granny has, she used to tell me about him, and I also have a tape which we had made into a CD and we play it occasionally, so it's like oral testimony. Well, she thought the world of him, and she says he thought the world of, of her family, you know. She would say, old farmer Pudge, the old farmer Pudge, he thought the world of us. Um, he used to bring us um, a sack of potatoes down, you know, in the huts and a bale of straw to make our beds up and sometimes eggs um, and we did all our own cooking and then on Friday night sometimes we'd go up there to his, his where he had the, the house by the hop kilns and she, she said, you know, he, he would um, give us a sub if we were a bit short, he was very good and he did like the Lanes and the Ripleys and he knew they'd come back year after year but he knew that they were good hop pickers that, that was the thing. They worked hard for him, and he helped them along. Um, and that's what I think, that, that mutual sort of feeling, it was a mutual feeling there. Yeah. Uh, when you're ready. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I mentioned that I belong to the Roman Heritage site. You know, I joined the Roman Heritage site on Facebook, and I, I told them that I was coming up here, and I, I sort of mentioned Bishop's Froome, and one guy, I had lots of comments about hot-picking all over the country, but there was one guy called George Painter, and he said that in the early 50s, he spent a lot of time here in the hot fields in Bishop's Froome. He says, The memories I have is of me and my twin sister taking a white enamel bucket with a lid to the pump in the village to fill it with water as there was no water, electric or gas in the old bungalows we used to stay in. We were aged about five or six. So that, that was, you know, one of, the, one of the, the comments I had. But there were many more telling me about a painter called Alfred Munnings who used to take, who used to paint pictures, um, beautiful photos of families um, in... He, he went out in the Hampshire countryside in 1913, but he also went further afield, and he, he took photos of horse-drawn caravans and hop pickers, so that was interesting. Um, and then I'll finish up, if it's okay with you, on this little story about my granny, Amy Lane. When she came here, when she was quite young, at 19, she was 19 then, so that was in 1931, and... I think I've got that right, but she said her father, my great-grandfather, he said to her, go down to the vicar, Amy, and see if he'll marry you and Alfie, because he could see that my granny and Alfie were in love. So she went down to the local, the church here in Bishop's Broom, um, and she had a word with him, and he, he, the vicar here said, no, I can't marry you, I'm afraid, because he said, we've had a few travelling families that have caused some problems. So we've had to say no to any more Romany weddings. And she said they were very upset. But she said, she said to him, I understand. And she said that her family were good pickers, they worked fast, and that soon their bushels were ready for counting. And there was one time when the families brought in 42 bushels in one time. <laughs> so that's it. They married in Middlesex in the registry office and they went into the pub um, and had a little celebration drink and then they went in one of the cinemas and ended up there for the evening. Yeah. Well, I think 
these stories are vital um, to f for us as, as you know because we, we live in this era where a lot of the old traditional things are no more we've got machines um, and life has changed so much over the last hundred years so I think it's it's really important to capture these stories to share them you know to share them with our children our grandchildren um, and to bring these characters to life because we'll never see the likes of them again <laughs>